are you excited? Are you excited? Because I'm excited. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct pleasure, my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce to you Derek Dingle, Senior Vice President and Chief Content Officer. Give him a warm, warm round of applause of Black Enterprise. Derek Dingle! Y'all can do better than that. Keep it going, 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 keep it going. This is Derek Dingle, y'all. Keep it going. Derek Dingle, welcome to the stage, brother. All right. I was going to try to jump up like Ramon, but... Um... Good evening, Charlotte. How are you doing to this evening? <laughs> BE in the QC. On behalf of Black Enterprise, I on behalf of Black Enterprise, I am share, pleased to share how excited we are here to be here in the Queen City, Charlotte, North Carolina, and how appreciative we are of the true Southern hospitality that we've received since our arrival. We are here ready to conduct business, and I can assure you, Charlotte is officially open for business. Actually, both of the Carolinas, North and South, can boast of, <laughs> shout out for South Carolina. <laughs> both can boast of its rapidly growing population of successful entrepreneurs. And just, a minute, just in a moment, we'll focus on our attention on local business opportunities occurring in these powerhouse states for entrepreneurs. But first, we have an official welcome from the city of Charlotte. It is my pleasure to welcome the Deputy Director of Economic Development here in the city of Charlotte and my good friend, Kevin Dick. Let's give Kevin some love. Right, so everyone is sitting back down now, but Ramon got you hyped. So I, I need for that to continue. So I'm going to ask for everyone to stand to your feet for me one more time, please. Everyone stand up, get the blood flowing again. And what I'm going to ask also is that if you are a current or former elected official or a veteran of the US Armed Forces, I'd like for you to remain standing when we're done with this, okay? Okay. So, over the past six months, the planning committees that worked with the city and Black Enterprise to help put this event together actually came up with the hashtag Enchant BE in the QC, okay? So, I need for you to show them a little bit more love and at the top of your lungs and from the bottom of your hearts, I need one more on the count of three. B-E in the QC. And if we don't get it right, we're going to do it again. <laughs> one, two, three. B-E in the QC! That'll work. All right. All right. Okay. Current and former elected officials. Any veterans, I'd like to acknowledge you for your service to your communities and to your country. So let's give them a round of applause. Okay, great. So as Derek said, I'm Kevin Dick, De Deputy Director for Economic Development with the city of Charlotte, North Carolina, the 17th largest city in the country the fourth fastest in terms of employment growth, the number one millennial attractor, but most importantly, the only one that is hosting the 23rd annual Black, en Black Enterprise Entrepreneur Summit. And so by the time I'm done with this speech, I expect you to either email your landlord back home, if you're from out of town, I expect you to email your landlord back home or text your realtor and give them, give them notice, because you'll be moving. So, or, or, and as importantly, relocating your business. But it gives me great pleasure 
to make these introductions this evening. I'm truly humbled uh, to serve Black Enterprise in this capacity on behalf of the city because Black Enterprise has made an indelible imprint uh, uh, on me personally throughout my adult and professional life. Whether it's been reading about uh, Earl Gray Sr. and my favorite basketball player of all time, Magic Johnson, partnering to buy Pepsi-Cola bottling, or whether it's been having the opportunity to sell BE subscriptions at the Javits Center in Manhattan, or having this privilege tonight, BE has influenced, inspired, motivated, and really propelled me. And so with that, I give a heartfelt thanks for Earl Butch Graves Jr. and for Derek Dingle for allowing this to happen. Now, there are two great things uh, about introducing the individuals I have the privilege of introducing tonight. Number one is that they have a lot in common. And number two is that they are true pioneers and they are truly the first to do one a lot, to, to the first people to do a lot of what they've been able to do during their careers. They both have ties to Columbia, South Carolina. One is the mayor of the city. The other was born in the city. They are both mayors and leaders of important cities along the I-77 corridor. And so with that, I'm gonna introduce our guest first. Southern hospitality, you have to be polite. So the Honorable Steve Benjamin is the first African-American mayor in the history of Columbia, South Carolina. Did you hear that? I said the first African-American mayor in the history of Columbia, South Carolina, having been elected in 2010 as the 36th mayor in the city's history. I'll say that again. He's the first African-American mayor out of 36. On November 8, 2017, he won his third term as mayor. And by the way, no one even bothered to run against him. <laughs> That's how popular Mayor Benjamin is. Not only is he a leader locally in Columbia, but he's also a leader nationally. He's president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. And in true Black, Ent Black Enterprise Entrepreneur Summit spirit, he is a successful entrepreneur, having been a principal with Benjamin Law Firm, LLC. And if you thought he didn't understand the law enough, he's married to a judge. <laughs> so it gives me great pleasure to introduce the Honorable Steve Benjamin, Mayor of Columbia, South Carolina. Okay, so I guess both mayors are gonna come out at once. Okay, I was just cued to that, all right. So, this next person really needs no introduction in the Queen City. Uh, the reason is due to the fact that she has been making a mark here since 1970, when she became one of the first African-American students at what was then Queens College, and now is Queens University in Charlotte. She was also a career City of Charlotte employee having risen through the ranks from budget analyst to budget director to assistant city manager prior to her retirement. She comes from a family of entrepreneurs, with her father having owned a successful construction company. She's also a member of the South Carolina Black Hall of Fame and a national leader in her own right, having held high-level positions with the National Forum for Black Public Administrators and other such organizations. And not only was she one of the first black students at Queens, she is also the first former city administrator to hold the title of mayor of the city. And last but not least, she is the first African-American female mayor of the city of Charlotte. That took place November 8th, 2017, when she became the 59th mayor in the city's history. The first African-American female out of 59 mayors. So as monumental as an accomplishment as that is, and as impressed as we all are, I'll tell you what impresses me the most. When I began with the city two years ago, and she was then mayor pro tem, 
Vi Lyles. In my first meeting with, meeting with her upon arriving at the city, after we exchanged pleasantries, the first thing she said to me was, how can I help you be more successful? How can I help you be more successful? And so I don't want to speak for Mr. Graves too much in this regard, but it would seem to me that this summit, this conference will be a raging success if it's nothing more than a series of conversations between individuals that always include, how can I help you be successful? And so with that, I would like to introduce not only the Honorable Mayor Steve Benjamin, but also the Honorable Mayor Viola A. Vi Lyles. And moderating today's fireside chat with the mayors will be Derek Dingle. Well, thank you for uh, being here. And uh, Mayor Lyles, thank you for um, uh, being our host for our 23rd annual Entrepreneur Summit. Uh, Mayor Benjamin, thank you for being here. BE and the QC, but BE <laughs> also loves SC. So. <laughs> um, today we want to talk about how the entrepreneurs in this room can access opportunities with the, with the city, how they can gain municipal contracts, how, they can, how the city supports them in terms of growth, and capacity building. But first I wanted to start off with your signature programs just to put into context your vision for your respective cities. Uh, Mayor Lyles, I'm gonna start off with you. Okay. Um, you've talked a, a great deal about economic mobility. Mm -hmm. uh, can you share with the audience what that thrust is about and how you seek to execute that? I will, but thanks um, for offering us this opportunity. I want you guys to know how proud we are to host you in Charlotte, first and foremost, and really are glad that you're here because what you are doing will make the difference for tomorrow and the next generation as well. So thank you. And thanks to Black Enterprise for doing this kind of conference because I would hope that at the end of this conference you would have walked away with at least five or six more contacts that could really help you grow your business or take that idea that you have to a new level. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Charlotte and why um, economic mobility is so important. About four years ago, Charlotte was ranked 50th in the large city category, 50th out of 50 and the lack of economic mobility, particularly for people of color. And the community was surprised. Now, if you were me, or if you were you, you were not surprised. That was not an issue because we've all known that government policy and private sector efforts built around those policies were built around the lack of opportunity and access to capital. And without capital in this country, you're just not going to be able to say that you have social mobility. We studied this program for about two years before the final report came out. And the report had a number of initiatives in it. But I want to just highlight two. The very first one was that we needed um, to build a place and a city that we could have diversity in talent and workforce. And what does that mean? that we needed to build a city where people could afford to live here. And so we focused on affordable housing as a governmental um, responsibility, but we also went to the private sector. So this year, the city of Charlotte will have on its bond referendum $50 million for affordable housing programs, which will be matched dollar for dollar by the private sector for $100 million. So if you work in the city, you can be able to live in the city. And that was an important aspect of what we were doing. 
The second part of this economic mobility focused on um, the part of, of understanding the importance of history and what we could do to change it. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the impact of government policies and how in Charlotte we're trying to change that and sometimes how difficult it is to be an entrepreneur, to be a small business, especially when you're a person of color. Uh, thank you, Mayor Lyles. Um, mayor Benjamin, um, as the mayor of Columbia, South Carolina, and as the uh, recently inducted president of the uh, Conference of Mayors, <laughs> You have a program called The Three Eyes. Um, explain what The Three Eyes are about and why that's important for this audience. Sure, well, uh, thank you, Derek, and uh, thank uh, Butch Graves, who we had a chance to briefly speak to earlier, and uh, to my, my friend, Viola Lyles, who always gives it to you straight, um, and uh, she's about getting things done. So excited to be here in Charlotte with all of you here, and, and I wanna say thank you to all of you for making it a point to be here at the Entrepreneur Summit. Um, Black Enterprise has meant so much to um, our community uh, for the last several decades, helping lead the charge and advocacy for, for black business development. I'm excited to be a part of this program. Uh, as I've ascended to the leadership of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, uh, we decided that for the next two years, we're gonna embark upon an, an, an initiative, an endeavor, uh, to focus on, like a laser beam, on our three eyes, as, as, as Derek uh, mentioned. Uh, recognizing that cities and metropolitan economies are driving the American economy. Uh, that regardless of what the, the um, uh, God bless the president, what he might say sometimes about our cities. Uh, the reality is that 85% uh, of all citizens in our country now live in cities and metropolitan economies. 89% of all jobs um, are in cities and metropolitan economies. 91% of America's $20 trillion gross domestic product is created in cities and metropolitan economies. Cities like Charlotte, boast a larger GDP in this region than many Western nations. Uh, New York City uh, enjoys one larger than the entire country of Russia. Uh, so you, you understand mayors are at the forefront of, of, of all business and business development, not just in our respective cities, the four corners of our municipal corporation, but the entire regions in which we drive. Um, our focus at the Conference of Mayors for the next few years will be around infrastructure, innovation, and inclusion. And uh, to briefly summarize them, and obviously I think we'll have some time for Q and A. Infrastructure, we recognize that regardless of who you talk to, America either has a $2 trillion or up to a $5.2 trillion infrastructure need. Wherever you live, uh, you see it in roads, you see it in water, sewer, stormwater, uh, transportation uh, needs, of the need, schools, hospitals, airports, the needs are great. And obviously every billion dollars you spend on infrastructure, you also put 15,000 people uh, to work. We're, we're at a point right now where the cost of capital is, is the lowest it's been in several generations. So finding ways, not just through traditional means of municipal finance, but also uh, through good public-private partnerships to really stimulate investment in infrastructure is just a smart, nonpartisan way to get the job done on behalf of all Americans. Our focus on innovation is clear. We're watching the world change rapidly every single day. Uh, the advent of automation and, and uh, advanced machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence. The future of work is changing rapidly. 65% of our children in kindergarten right now will work in fields that don't exist right now. The power of data and data analytics, the way it's changing the world, it requires us to focus on opportunities and resources that are being deployed to the, to the tune of, the tri of trillions of dollars over the next decade into uh, what it takes for us to be smart cities. I, I talked to uh, a vendor uh, a day, probably I think may allow us as well, all of us trying to help us figure out how we monetize this, this incredible deployment of, of everything from uh, small cell technology that allows us to, to deploy small cells around our city, prepare for ubiquitous uh, Wi-Fi and broadband and, and whatever that might bring all the autonomous vehicles, whatever it happens to be. But the focus on innovation and, and recognizing that, that the world is changing very rapidly and we've got to make sure we participate in the innovation economy. And then lastly, um, obviously, uh, the importance of inclusion. Uh, making sure that um, each of us participates in the largesse uh, of this incredible uh, economy that we're living in right now. 
um, what Mayor Lyle spoke about um, earlier, the, what we're seeing in terms of economic mobility, the challenges are, are global. Uh, those of us who have capital are, are seeing the benefits of a, of a growing economy, but those of us, people who work hard every single day, uh, work hard from sunup to sundown, sometimes several jobs, uh, are not seeing their paychecks grow. We're seeing great research uh, conducted by Pew and others that show over the last uh, 50, 60 years that our children are not doing as well as their parents did. And many of you grew up in a household like mine where it was, it was, it was understood uh, that I would do better than my parents, that they made sure they worked hard every single day so that my brother and I had opportunities they never enjoyed growing up in, in the segregated uh, South. So um, a focus on inclusion and making sure that, that from literally the, 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 the cradle to making sure that re-entering uh, citizens coming, coming out of our departments of corrections to also focus on, uh, focusing on the, the, the issue of asset management. How do we make sure that more of our investment banks and, 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 and our incredibly talented asset managers are, are, are getting incredible returns on investments for our pension systems and, and philanthropic institutions that they're participating in managing the pension funds that, that all of us help uh, uh, put into these large pension systems every single day. So, we, so it, it's all about infrastructure, it's about innovation, and it's about inclusion. There's so many different things to talk about, but those three uh, encapsulate the three priorities that we decide to focus on for the next two years. It, to um, <clears throat> unpack the, the visions that both of you share, you know, a, a common theme is, is one of inclusion, business inclusion. And in terms of the, the growth of the cities from an infrastructure standpoint, construction, what have you, how are we and how are you, both of you, ensuring that you know, black businesses are fully participating in the, the growth of the cities? You know, in, in Charlotte, you know, there is you know, great construction throughout the city, the airport. Um, how are you ensuring that African-American firms, and I know a lot has talked about MWBEs, but I want to focus on African-American firms specifically, how they are benefiting from the boom, how they are accessing opportunities to, uh, to contracts. And then I'm going to follow up with you, Mayor. Well, let me just talk a little bit about some history in Charlotte. Um, you know, we were, we were a growing city um, before the recession. And we were beginning to have a very active minority business participation program. And because it was active, we were sued. And we had to disband our program. Um, and we had to begin to comply with new federal regulations requiring disparity studies, requiring us to restructure the entire program. So when you talk about how difficult it is to be an African American business owner, you really can't look just to government. So I'm going to fast forward to today and say, what is the vision that we can have for African American businesses to be successful? And I would say in Charlotte and our region, if we can't do it in government, then what are we going to do? And when you're in Charlotte and you're looking across the street downtown, you'll see a cultural campus that was really started by the city government, but was engaged with an idea by one of our large financial institutions. And the thing that we did from our arena to that financial institution is that we worked with the CEO and we said to him, you can do this because you want to have a city that you want to be proud of. That means having diversity and inclusion. And that CEO set a 20% minority goal and said that we will focus on African Americans, not women, not other um, minorities, but African American minorities. And they exceeded that goal with the construction of that tower. So when I go out as mayor today, I talk to our healthcare industries who have stepped up once again on construction, saying that they are going to focus on minority construction goals for their buildings, and they too have adopted a model that we as government can't adopt and still be in compliance with federal law. So what I say about how do we get African American businesses wherever you live, you have to have a partnership between government and the private sector. 
but you have to tell the private sector that they have an accountability to everyone in this community. If they're going to be successful, then we need to have African American businesses be successful. And that's whether it's from event space and planning to building a tower. That's the way that we've tried to approach it. Now, I'm not saying it's all going great. We've had some great successes, but it is a hard job because when most people look at this, they think, well, you know, I don't know anybody, and I'm like, don't worry about that. We can fix that. If you get the right person in your organization, you can have a better program than anything government can do. Um, may <laughs> I'm going to ask this question of um, Mayor Benjamin, but I'd, I'd also like you to um, uh, offer your, um, your, your vantage point as well, Mayor Lyles. You know, we've, at Black Enterprise, we've you know, reported on the nexus between you know, government and business for the last 48 years. I uh, looked at our B100s for the last um, 46 years. A key part of that research was examining the mayorship of Maynard Jackson, first African-American American mayor of Atlanta. He put in place minority set-asides in the 70s, but in mandates when he was you know, re-elected. He created more black millionaires than any other public official, and it's been you know, documented. Why? Isn't there a way in today's environment to mandate participation, minority participation, in all of the projects that we're seeing? Yes, I think you should ask the lawyer that yeah, question. Yeah, because, because <laughs> even lawyer who's not practicing law, right? Yeah, now. yeah. The, because um, yeah. no, that's that's a wonderful um, uh, question, Derek. Thank you. And I, I would say uh, I, I love the depth of Mayor Liza's answers. I will tell you, I'm not sure there's another major city in the country that also has as a mayor, a, a seasoned public administrator as well. Uh, it's a it's unique skill set that adds, I think, to the depth of, um, of the leadership here in Charlotte. The, um, and, it, and we were preparing in our, in our conference call for this uh, session, and, the, and, that, and that question came up and, um, by Mayor Lyles' <laughs> response, was, 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 was just as, as she just articulated. Now, how are you, how are you Maynard Jackson, in a post Maynard Jackson world? Yeah. It's, a, it's a real and legitimate question. The, the laws have changed, Supreme Court's changed, I and mean, it's, it's a different world. So I do believe that, um, as Mayor Lyles uh, just stated, there has to be a, a significant degree of intentionality to all things you do inside uh, the, the city that you can control, but also using the force of, of your office, the bully pulpit of your office, to influence your, your, your potential partners who pay a great deal of attention to what the city does and what the city wants as, as well. Uh, we've been intentional. Uh, in, our, in our city, we spend most of our money on an aggressive, on a, on an aggressive infrastructure build out. Uh, we're, we're almost uh, three fourths of the way through what will be a billion dollar uh, build out of our water, our sewer, and our, infra and our uh, stormwater uh, infrastructure for the city. Uh, we made it a point, particularly when it comes to professional services, that every single deal we've done, every bond deal we've done in the last eight years since I've been mayor has included an African-American investment banking firm, has included an African-American uh, firm as bond counsel uh, on, on the uh, transaction, has included an African-American firm uh, as co-underwriters co counsel on, on the transaction. And, and it requires, again, that intentionality. Sometimes we actually do pay a little bit more. Uh, making sure that there, there's, team, there's a team, there's diversity, there's a good mentor-protege relationship, building people up to, to prepare uh, to maybe take on some projects on, on their own. Several of our, of our deals are senior managed, I might also say, by African-American-owned firms from across uh, the country. Uh, we were intentional as we built our new baseball stadium uh, to make sure that we had good, strong representation, not just from African-American firms, uh, but also from the people who live in our city, who work in our city, many of whom never thought they'd have an opportunity to, to, to work to build this stadium. We went to our homeless shelter. We went to our housing authority. We recruited uh, men and, and women. We had 54 or so who applied uh, to, to learn to build things, uh, from masonry work to hanging sheetrock. We had about 30 that got through the program um, and helped build 
the stadium and now 11 were permanently employed by the team after we were done. Just trying to make sure we're reaching across uh, um, our, our, our economic uh, spectrum to get people engaged in, in, in the process of, of earning uh, money. But it requires an intentionality and I, and I think it, it requires you constantly articulating to your private sector partners with the values of your city are. We, we want our city to be the most talented, educated, and entrepreneurial city in America. That requires every single one to be at the table. Our city is black, it's white. Uh, the reality is we have people from 200 different countries who speak 90 different languages. We want that to be reflected in our, in our contracting. And I will say this too, you have to be smart enough and humble enough to also ask for help and advice in council. We have a wonderful minority business advisory uh, council that we established several years ago, several of them are here in the room today, and um, met with them uh, briefly last week. And, and it's their job to give us good ideas. It's their job to press us and push us, to help us establish good programs, and to keep us honest, uh, keep pushing us and helping us be better. The, the laws and the world's different than- How the, much uh, push? Than, than, than when, uh, I tell you what, <laughs> uh, but, but you need that. You need, you need that good positive pressure. Uh, the laws are different than when Mayor, when Mayor Jackson uh, was, in, was in office, um, but demands um, are just as significant. I dare say the challenges are greater and more complex, and we've got to be much more creative. And I will tell you, there's a whole lot more capital in the system. We've got to figure out very creatively how we have everyone participating um, uh, in the process. Mayor Benjamin talked about having minority business involved in at least advising on policy making. It's the same uh, structure in place in, in Charlotte. Absolutely, and and, and yeah. in terms of the, 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 the pushback and in terms of the, the counsel and the criticism, how much do you see you know, in terms of whether you're going that <clears throat> extra limit to make sure that you know, minority businesses are at the table and that they have the ability to grow to the capacity to manage you know, multi-million uh, dollar contracts and eventually become primes? You know, I think that if you don't have an advisory group with you, then you think that you're the smartest person in the room. And I know I'm never the smartest person in the room. So you do need that advice. You need those folks to come in because you can't be out there on the street every day experiencing what they experience. So when they come to you and tell you their story, I listen because they speak from experience and truth at a place that perhaps I'm not aware of. So almost every one of our economic development projects that we have, we have an advisory committee, but particularly around a minority um, business program. We call it the Charlotte Inclusion Program now, and it's our revamped um, program after the um, lawsuit that we had to settle with our disparity study. But what we've done is tried to turn that from being a um, demand program to an inclusive program by providing, for example, financing, low interest financing, providing um, through a credit union where the city actually put in um, several millions of dollars to spin off and work with that credit union so that you can get a loan to start a business or to bridge the time between that award that you have and the slow pay that you often have to experience. So we have some things that we tried to fix that were very specific problems built in real circumstances of people that are out here trying to make a living and running a business. So we do things in addition to that. If you're in our city and community and you've got um, a service industry retail, we do facade grants. We do a number of initiatives so that we can get your infrastructure so that you can be competitive with um, what I would call, and what one of the stories that I heard recently, is how can I start a shop when the national chains are coming in? Mm -hmm. And the, way, the only way that we can do that is by trying to make sure our zoning works, that our regulatory reform doesn't stand in your way, and when you need that extra push for what it takes, that there's either a financing methodology or something that we can work cooperatively with you to do. Because if you have a great business community, then you're going to have great neighborhoods. If you have great neighborhoods, you're going to have stable families. And that's what we want for our city. So, so the objective there is to bring entrepreneurs into the ability of um, gaining access into areas that they haven't had access before. Right. And at the same time, uh, Mayor Benjamin, can you go through and, and focus on 
how you engage in the whole capacity building process. Because one challenge, obviously, is one of availability and opportunity. The other challenge is having firms that have the capacity to take advantage of those opportunities. Sure. Um, well, actually, today in Colombia, we hosted our Access to Capital uh, compo uh, Symposium uh, in Colombia, Office of Business Opportunity. And I encourage some of you who have not been to Colombia, come visit. Uh, come and, and see the opportunities, see the development and growth that's happening in, in South Carolina's capital uh, city. Uh, but access to capital is still a significant uh, issue for, for so many businesses. Uh, we have only um, one um, African-American-owned bank in South Carolina uh, right now. Uh, we maintain an active and significant and growing depository relationship with that bank because of the key role it plays in, in, in obviously uh, giving people access to opportunities to build their, their businesses. Uh, we have a, 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 a robust mentor-protege um, uh, program at the seat of Columbia, and we decided that uh, as, we, as we continue to grow that program, transparency is key. So if you were to be very bored and decide you want to look at some of our council meeting agendas like we uh, had last night, uh, we break out on our agenda exactly uh, how uh, our, our programs, are, our, our contracts are awarded. So if a contract is awarded to someone who's a prime, uh, the expectations are that, that minority-owned businesses uh, will participate, and by, by each specific category, the, the percentage of the participation, the dollar amount associated with that is, is, is public knowledge. That type of transparency is key. It keeps us all on our game. And we've had some opportunities um, to, to develop some good, strong protégés because of this, and we've also had some, you know, some, 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 some challenges. Um, uh, uh, not, both with mentors and proteges. I mean, occasionally you'll have, a, 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 you'll have some um, majority-owned businesses and, you, and you'll make clear what your expectations are in terms of participation. And uh, sometimes they'll show up and, and the, the, the team won't be diverse or, uh, or the uh, diversity is, is not re reflected in the, in the, in the uh, apportionment of the contract. And we've had opportunities to cancel contracts uh, because we just didn't think it reflected the values of the city. And we'll continue to do that if we think people aren't on stand stepping up uh, to uh, what we need. But good mentor protege program. I encourage you guys to go to ColumbiaSC.net uh, to visit our, our website for our Office of Business Opportunities uh, to check out our commercial revolving loan fund uh, that helps us uh, um, lever up uh, uh, businesses that want to do business not just with the city but also in the city. That's a great program. I, I've read it and I wish that we had it. It's a really good program. So, Mayor Lyles, how, how do you go about um, further engagement with the um, minority business community? Having them come to sessions with city council, having them explore different contracting opportunities, breaking down the certification process so that they're, they're ready when opportunities, uh, to pounce on opportunities. I, I actually have to say that in our community, I found that minority businesses have several associations that they formed, and that strength in numbers and the investment in the talent within their own skill sets, I don't have to so much go to them, they come to me. And they have answers and they have questions, and we have a very active advocacy group. And they're not only active advocating for businesses small businesses, entrepreneurs, African-American-owned businesses, but they're active politically. And they actually talk to you and, and, and describe, have you been successful at what you're doing? And they, they, they insert themselves in the process. And they do that in a way that allows me to be able to go into the private sector and say, this is a group of organized people with talent and skills and strengths. Look at the successes they've had, and how can you tell me you can't find someone because they helped me do that? So when, when you go to the private sector, you know, and, and you did share, share an example, what do they say when you, 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 um, you know, push them on why they're not using more diverse firms? You know, what's, why wouldn't they use more diverse firms you know, given the, the makeup of the respective cities and also the, uh, the potential for, for innovation? I think it's just like human nature. You go to what you've always done. And people have, our institutions, our private sector industries have grown. 
and they've grown with someone that maybe started out as a small business. They just happen to be, you know, available and they've continued to use them. So you have to go with data and you have to explain to them, take that data, but be able to explain the reason that this person is now a million dollar plus construction firm, a million dollar plus staffing agency, or whatever it is, is because you brought them along. And so if you are going to um, do that for one person in our community, you can do that for more people. And that's kind of the way I start off. And I also point to the successes. Our arena had a goal of 20% and they did 23 plus. And so we start talking about Go talk to the Fred Whitfield at the um, Hornets. Go talk to the people at Wells Fargo. Go talk to Bank of America and just make sure that that whole fear factor, and I'm not quite sure why it's there, but it's just, let's just say it is, it is there. And to show where success leads to additional success. And it's just about building relationships. I'm gonna ask you uh, one, uh, one other question, uh, Mayor Benjamin, before I go to uh, the, the Q&A. Uh, you talked about um, smart cities. Um, share with us how entrepreneurs in this audience, uh, especially young entrepreneurs, can access opportunities as the city is becoming more tech-driven from transportation to public safety. And what has been put in place in um, Columbia to um, try to facilitate more of that, that innovation? Sure, oh, the world's changing very rapidly and the power of data, as Mayor Lyle's reference, and, and data analytics that help us become much more efficient organizations and, and deliver better customer service to our citizens is gonna continue to start driving uh, our decisions and, uh, and um, hopefully make us much more effective as we step into uh, the, um, I guess the second quarter of the 21st century. Uh, a smart city is, is uh, and some people ask me, well, what's the opposite of a smart city? It's not, it's not a dumb city. Uh, but, but a smart city is a city that, that uses data and, and, and prepares itself to use data to, to become much more effective, much more efficient. Uh, that means that uh, in, in our city, we're in, we're in the process, for example, of going through our advanced metering um, uh, uh, infrastructure program in which every citizen uh, on our system, 300, 400,000 uh, people will be able to tell exactly if you have a small water leak or a major water leak. You'll be able to monitor your water usage uh, from your cell phone. And it tells you exactly whether or not uh, uh, you're, you're using a lot of water or, or, or not. It allows you to conserve uh, in a better way and hopefully manage your city finances, and your, your personal finances in a way uh, that, um, uh, that reflects the major challenges people are, are having at home. Uh, with uh, rising, the rising cost of, of, of living. Uh, as we roll out this uh, AMI uh, program, there are opportunities from everyone from plumbers, literally plumbers, uh, to uh, folks who are data professionals uh, as, as we roll out this infrastructure, which requires us to go and put small, sen small sensors uh, literally uh, in, in every home uh, in business uh, throughout our city and our metropolitan area that, that we serve. So something as simple as that, to thinking of, of course about the broader area of, of small cell infrastructure. Some of you may have seen these small cells popping up in the downtowns uh, where, where you live that will allow uh, folks to, to have incredibly ubiquitous broadband, the densification uh, of, 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 of wireless communication uh, that will allow for autonomous vehicles, building those small cells, installing those small cells, recognizing that our, our large, uh, uh, firms, tech firms, and, and, and others who deliver that infrastructure from Crown Castle or Mobility and others are, are all going to be spending literally trillions of dollars uh, in that space over the next decade, recognizing that where those small cells go, if they're not in public right of way, uh, it goes, they go on private, sec, private land, it's a real estate play, owning land and, and leasing that space uh, to those who might be, uh, uh, those of you who might be real estate um, uh, professionals or, or barons here. There's so many different ways to participate uh, in, in the smart city economy. I'd encourage some of you maybe even to look at uh, some of the research. It's, it's everywhere right now uh, from uh, McKinsey and, and, and Pew, uh, the Joint Center on, on, uh, in, 
in Washington, D.C. has done some fantastic work, particularly uh, looking at smart cities and innovation and the way it's going to affect communities of color. Uh, the, 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 the change, the future of, of work as we know it will automate out several jobs that significantly affect people who are, uh, who are black and brown in America and how are we preparing our communities for this, for this shift. Uh, so, um, so there are a number of different ways to participate in the innovation economy. Uh, we just got to focus on and, and focus and focus on 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 a few things, or, or maybe one thing. Don't try to do 20 things. Uh, let's try to be excellent at, at one or a few things and, and, and make some money. You're researching the trend and then finding your niche within those trends. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, we're going to open it up for uh, questions. We can take um, a few questions. And, and please, we, we need to limit it to, um, to actually uh, questions so that we can get as many in as possible. Hi, good, good evening. Um, I'm listening to Lewis Ellis from Columbia, South Carolina. And um, I own LLE Construction Group. So excited to see our mayor and Mayor Lyles. My question is- Well, I was is, born in Columbia. I, I just know. want you to know that now. <laughs> I usually I, say that. I wasn't going to say it. <laughs> And her brother's right over there. That's right. He's on our Minority Business Advisory Council. <laughs> um, my question is, um, when you think about um, infrastructure for the city, the largest budget is usually water and sewer. Um, are the cities creating a pipeline to start developing, when you think about capacity building, developing our minority contractors? And I don't mean um, non-white businesses, <laughs> African-American contractors to be, to be able to, to do those type of services in the water and sewer industry, considering the amount of funding that the city spend on water and sewer. Are we looking at how can we develop an infrastructure or a pipeline of developing these contractors to do that work? Pipeline and water yes, and sewer. Yes, absolutely. Um, the, our mentor protege program, um, we, we specifically have, a, have assigned uh, uh, mentor majority prime contractors with, with proteges in the city, and we've been able to develop some folks uh, into that business. And, you know, it's, it's an interesting business. Much of, much of the work of water sewer infrastructure delivery, there's nothing glamorous about it, y'all. Uh, it, it, is, it is hard work, subterranean hard work, and we've been able to, um, uh, to grow a few firms in that space. There's also a significant amount of, of work and, uh, and money to be made in the engineering services that go along with that. We've had some good uh, participants in, in, in that space, some who, who, who've thrived and some uh, not as much. Which has been a uh, growing sector of our uh, B100s. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I just want to add something, and I'm going to um, speak candidly here. One of the largest minority firms in Charlotte did water and sewer. He worked really hard, built a great business, and had no plans for the next generation. Mm -hmm. And when you have a family-owned business, the one thing that I would say to you is don't wait until you have no choice but to figure out what the next level of work will be done. But look, there's a lot of stuff online about this, how to make your family business go to the next generation. He did not do that, and he's no longer the largest minority contractor doing this work in Charlotte. So just think about this. We work hard, but plan just as hard. Create a, create a model for sustainability. Next question. Hi, my name is Atima Louie. I have a software company, and at my company, we're committed to hiring engineers that are majority women or um, ethnic minorities. And I loved hearing you talk about your commitments to your cities um, around innovation and being prepared for the data economy in the future. Can you talk to us about any initiatives you have to educate people of color, women, underrepresented people um, in the engineering industry, particularly computer science and the ability to code? The, the, uh, the need for greater uh, tech education and how that can lead to entrepreneurial opportunities as well. Well, in Charlotte, we have a couple of incubators, and we have a what they call FinTech um, program going on right now. And one of the issues that we have is getting women and minorities to participate in that. So I don't know if Sherelle Dorsey is in the audience, but we have a group here called Black Tech now. 
And she sees her mission in this community as doing exactly as you say it, that how do you get minorities, black people particularly, to be able to participate in the technology. So she helps maneuver through all of the systems. One of the largest um, technology companies that we have, brand new, called Passport, you know, when you put your credit card in the parking meter, that's what they do. And when you go up on their floor, they're not as diverse as I would like to see. And that means they often tell me, you've got to bring in people that have been trained in this direction. So black tech is helping people understand that they can change careers and get this accomplished if you just have an interest in doing that. And then if you have that training and you're coming to Charlotte, how do you get involved in it? Because we know that financial technology is the innovation of the future, the whole artificial intelligence. And one day I expect, you know, how money will, I don't know, maybe we won't even need it. It'll just be a card somewhere. But at that point, now we are not ready and we have to do more, and I appreciate the nonprofit world, Black Tech and Charlotte, Black Tech Charlotte, for doing that. Yeah, we have some uh, great firms in Columbia we've been working with, primarily some public-private partnerships through our, our Regional Technology Council, Ingenuity SC, uh, that's allowed us to work very closely with our school district, Richmond School District 1, to develop a pipeline of talent. Uh, uh, it's been, and we've seen, I will tell you, we've seen some incredible uh, success uh, with our, our, our black girls and our black boys uh, uh, choosing to, to chase careers in STEM. Uh, prior to the Interstate Banking Act, we actually had some large banks based in South Carolina. They all came to <laughs> North Carolina uh, across the border after North Carolina really uh, made some significant strides in interstate banking, but left behind a very strong uh, legacy of framework uh, of, of, of financial uh, firms as well as a strong ins insurance technology cluster uh, that um, continues to be one of the uh, best in, in the country. Uh, I think uh, uh, second only to um, Hartford and, and, and maybe Silicon Valley in, in some way. Uh, we're seeing some significant investment in that space and continue to engage with our tech leaders locally, but also spending some time in trips to Silicon Valley, pushing for more inclusion and diversity in the industry. Okay. Uh, Mayor Lyles, Mayor Benjamin, uh, thank you for um, sharing how you're driving opportunities for African American businesses as well as what's coming on the horizon for those uh, innovators who can seize opportunities. Uh, please, let's give um, Mayor Lyles and Mayor Benjamin a round of applause. Please. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. That was an amazing session, ladies and gentlemen. Amazing, amazing session. So listen, tomorrow morning, we're going to kick off our first full day of the summit with Fireside Chats featuring two extraordinary entrepreneurs, Byron Allen and Troy Taylor. That's going to start tomorrow morning at 8.30 a.m. Listen, doors are going to open at 8 a.m., so you see how it's crowded in here. Seats are filling up. You definitely want to get here on time. In fact, you want to get here early. Also, our host, sponsor nationwide will be holding a raffle tomorrow during the morning session so bring those business cards nationwide is going to host an amazing raffle ladies and gentlemen we're entering the next part of our amazing conference today please give a very very warm welcome to the associate vice president of diverse and cause marketing for nationwide and our host sponsor for the Black Enterprise Entrepreneur Summit, Mr. Lou Yarbrough III. Please give him a round of applause. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Lou Yarbrough. I'm the Associate Vice President of Diverse and Cause Marketing at Nationwide. And on behalf of our CEO, Steve Rasmussen, and our over 30,000 associates across the country, I want to say thank you for being here with us this evening. And we hope that this is just the beginning of a very great and special summit. Um, 
you know, Nationwide is a, a proud partner with Black Enterprise, and we're glad to be the host sponsor of this event again yet this year. We appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today. Um, and we're no stranger to Charlotte. You know, through our relationship and partnership with the CIAA, every time we come to Charlotte, it's, it's like coming home. So it's great to be here. Um, but tonight, uh, we want to talk about our eight-year relationship with Black Enterprise and the support that we, along with Black Enterprise, have been giving uh, minority uh, uh, businesses and look to do, continue to do moving forward. I also would be remiss if I did not give a special thanks and shout out to Butch Graves, uh, the Graves family, and the entire BE team for their tirelessly, their, their effort uh, in curating what is sure to be another great uh, summit here uh, today. I also want to let you know that the reason Nationwide is here, I often get asked the question, you know, why is such a big company, Fortune 68 company, uh, so committed to connecting with small businesses? And, and the answer is simple. We weren't always a big business. Uh, you know, we didn't start out as a Fortune 68 company. We started out as a small group of individuals with a uh, common, noble purpose around cre creating more value for our members, as well as making a positive difference in the lives of others. So we know what can happen when a small group of individuals are committed uh, and have a goal in mind. And so that's why we're here. We're here to connect and meet with you. So make sure that you take advantage of all of the opportunities, not only to network, but also to take advantage of the resources and tools available, because what you will see over the next couple of days could actually change the trajectory of your business and of your life. And with that said, I'm going to move out of the way. I want you to remember one thing. Nationwide is on your side. That was amazing. Can we give Mr. Yarborough even another round of applause? We can do better than that, ladies and gentlemen. Can we give Mr. Yarborough another round of applause? Thank you, Mr. Yarborough, for those kind words. That was amazing. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the president and CEO of Black Enterprise, Earl Butch Graves, Jr. You could do better than that. We can give him more. Give him more love. Give him more love. Give him more love. Give him more love. It looks like my mother must have put you all up to this. Well, good evening, everyone. And thank you, and please join me in giving a special thanks to Lou Yarborough once again and our friends at Nationwide. We are proud that Nationwide continues to be our host sponsor now for the eighth year in a row. I think a prime example of how serious North and South Carolina are about, this economic, about its economic growth and support and promotion of entrepreneurship and small business is demonstrated by the appearance of its two biggest advocates, Mayor Steve Benjamin and the mayor of this great city, Vi Lyles. Let's give them another round of applause as well. Thank you once again for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us. Uh, as you will hear from a number of different people, we have reached a record number of registrants we will have over 1,200 people registered for the Entrepreneur Summit here in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, I'm going to mention it again tomorrow, but I, I want to thank, in particular, uh, our outstanding steering committee, uh, led by Kevin Dick and my man Smudgy, James Smudgy Mitchell. So let me give them both a round of applause for their work and what they've done. Tonight, we are blessed with something truly unique. We're blessed to have the ultimate maverick, no pun intended, who has joined us here to help officially kick off the 2018 Entrepreneur Summit. He is the owner of one of the most valuable franchises in sports, the NBA world champion Dallas Mavericks. He is also a shark from the popular ABC TV competition series, Shark Tank. 
and clearly one of the sharpest entrepreneurial minds of his generation. His meteoric climb to billionaire status has dazzled and inspired multitudes for its audacity and winning plays. And this evening, he joins us for an in-depth and motivating one-on-one -on -one conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Mark Cuban. Well, Mark, thank you for coming and joining us uh, here in the Queen City. I don't know you guys served alcohol, because that's the only reason everybody's standing. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 uh, not at all. Well, we're thrilled. We're delighted to have you, Mark, and to join us uh, for this fireside chat. Um, this is unique in that we have, uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, we will have some 1,200 current entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs who will join us for this, uh, this unique conference. Um, and I think a lot of people know you as the Dallas Mavericks owner. Uh, the truth of the matter is, that, was, is that, that happened later. Right. Right. You were, you've been a serial entrepreneur for a long period of time. Since I'm 12 years old. Right. Um, grew up in Pittsburgh, right. PA. Yep. Steelers fan. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> but I got to tell you a quick story that the mayor just reminded me of. The, the new owner of the uh, Carolina to the Panthers um, grew up in Pittsburgh with me. Oh, and, that's right. And I didn't know him very well at all, but someone sent me a picture of me and him at a mutual friend's Sweet 16 party. <laughs> so, Who was more successful at the six, Sweet 16 party? Oh, we were, let's put it this way. We were the kids in the corner with the glasses. It, it, yeah, it wasn't pretty. It was Sweet 16 for them, not us. So you went to University of Pittsburgh for a year, mm -hmm. had a number of different, uh, started a number of different businesses even in that one year that you well, were yeah, there I, I dropped out of high school. So I wanted to take business. And the high school I went to didn't offer any business classes unless I was a senior in high school. And I'm like, come on, I, I mean, I'm trying to be ambitious. And they're like, no. And so um, I took some classes at night at the University of Pittsburgh. And then just since I was enrolled at Pitt, I just stopped going to class in high school and <laughs> kept on going to class at Pitt. And they allowed me to transfer back my credits to graduate from high school. So I, I officially was a high school dropout until I rectified that. And you decided, uh, I thought your choice, you went to Indiana University. Right. So, Pitt didn't have a full undergrad business program, just a few classes, and so I saw a list of the top 10 business schools, and I picked out the cheapest one, and it was Indiana. Yeah. <laughs> and I'd never seen it, never seen the campus, didn't know anything about it other than the basketball team, and I was like, that's good enough for me, let's go. Well, that's outstanding. The, uh, what I thought was unique, so when you were in Indiana, mm -hmm. again, this serial entrepreneur thing was beating in your chest, Yep. right? Um, and you'll come to it in a minute in regards to how you can't work for anybody else because that wouldn't work. But what is it that drove you? Tell us a little bit about your family and, and what you came from, sure. your, your background, where you came from, and then what drove you in this sense that you wanted to go into business for yourself, knowing that business was your thing. Um, my dad did upholstery on cars, so if you got a rip in your car seat, you would take it to where he worked. Um, my mom did work odd jobs from wherever. And we, you know, we had, we lived in an okay neighborhood, um, but we weren't poor by a long shot, but we were truly middle class. And I, over and over, my dad didn't go to college, my mom didn't go to college, and so they would beat into me, you're going to college. And they used to make me work at odd jobs so that I would learn the value of work. And, and you know, one, I'd go where my dad worked doing it with cars, and he'd make me sweep the whole, and this place was nasty, make me sweep all the time, you know. Um, tried to get me a job in a mill, but couldn't get me a job in a mill. Um, my mom wanted me to lay carpet because she was worried about me if I didn't have a trade. And so she got a, a friend of hers to try to get me, to teach me how to lay carpet. And if you ever go, there's this little office in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. If you trip over the carpet, that's where I learned how to lay carpet. Um, 
and I was going through these things. I'm like, this is just not me. And, and I always had that, that individual spirit to say, okay, you know, I can come up with things that can make me money. I mean, when I was nine, I would sell baseball cards. When I was 12, um, I told my dad I wanted a pair of basketball shoes. And it just so happens he was playing poker with his buddies, who were all probably rip-roaring drunk at the time, and I, I just didn't realize it. But I was like, Dad, I want a new pair of tennis shoes. You know, the, the new Beta Bullets were coming out or whatever they were, and um, new Converse. And he's like, you see those shoes on your feet? They work just fine. When you have a job, you can go buy whatever you want. I'm like, Dad, I'm 12. I don't have a job. And one of his buddies stood up, was not stood up, but he said, hey, I got, some, I got a job for you. He had these boxes of garbage bags. And he's like, I I've got these boxes of garbage bags. I don't know what to do with Why don't you sell them? I'm like, cool, you know, what do they cost me? And they literally were a box of 100 these blue garbage bags that he would sell them to me for three bucks. And then I, would, I went door to door. And I was like, hi, my name is Mark. Do you use garbage bags? <laughs> and I learned I could sell. It was just like, okay, six bucks, you know, I'll drop them off whenever you need them. Just call me. And I, I made some money, bought my shoes and... You know, and that just gave me confidence, and it took off from there. So you, after you graduated from Indiana, Indiana, uh, and I was asking you this back in the uh, backstage, I said, you moved to Dallas, right. Texas. And I said, well, what in the world made you decide to move to Dallas, Texas? And you had a great answer, but I'd <laughs> love you to share it with the audience. So what made you decide, growing up in Pittsburgh, moving to Indiana, my next stop should be Dallas. That's where I want to start. So um, a couple of my buddies from Indiana had moved down to Dallas. And I'm like, call my phone. What's it like? What is, what's it like? And he goes, well, you know, compared to India, the weather's great. The economy is, is really good. And the women are beautiful. And I didn't hear anything about the economy or anything else. <laughs> and so <laughs> I was like, here I come. I had a 1977 Fiat X19 that literally had a hole in the floorboard. And also, I had to carry, you know, the quarts of oil in the little trunk it had. So I didn't have, I couldn't bring a lot of stuff, but I, I'll, I'll never forget getting closer and closer to Indiana and seeing the white line go by, you know, in the bottom of the floorboard. And it was just like, <laughs> it, it was meant to be, I guess. So you got to Dallas and you got a job. Yeah. Or took a job. I, two jobs. Two jobs. I got a job working at night as, as a bartender at a place called Alon's. And then I got a job um, selling software at a company called Your Business Software. That didn't work out too good. No. Um, the bar, I, I couldn't, the bar, <laughs> that was a whole different story. We won't go there. <laughs> but um, working at Your Business Software, it actually went really good for a while because um, I, I didn't have a tech background. And so it gave me the opportunity to teach myself. And I found out that I liked tech, you know, which was shocking to me. And so I would sit in there and use the computers and teach myself all the software from way back when, the Word Stars, the Word Perfects, the, you know, the Peachtree softwares for those of us that go way back when. And um, one day, and, and mind you, I'm, sleep, I'm living in, in a three-bedroom apartment with six guys, six 23, 24-year-old guys. However nasty you think it is, it was worse. <laughs> I didn't have a closet. I didn't have a, a drawer. I had a pile. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I wore contacts. I wore contacts, so, but I wore my glasses at night. And I didn't have any money, so I broke my glasses. And I would take them up, and they'd tear them apart. And I had one piece here, one piece there. Oh, it was an adventure. But, um, <laughs> but so one day, I'm, I'm living in this sh shithole. And... Um, I get the opportunity to close a big deal. And it was gonna be $1,500 commission to me. I'm like, yes sir, let's go. And um, I call my boss, a guy named Michael Hugh Mecki, um, and I say, Michael, I've got this deal. And part of my job responsibilities were sweeping the floor, it was a retail store, sweeping the floor, making sure the windows were clean and opening it up. And I've got you know, one of my um, fellow employees all set to do all that. I call him up, I say, Michael, it's a $15,000 sale, but I need to go pick it up before, before work. I won't be there to open things up. He goes, no, I need you to open up the store. I'm like, I got it covered. And I, I make the executive decision that I'm going to go pick up the check, and I'm going to hand him the check, 
and he's going to forget all about it, and we're all going to be friends, and I'll make my commission. Fired me for disobeying him. Um, I haven't seen him since, but... That was probably the best thing that could have happened. Yeah, right? <laughs> um, but in any event, um, but it made me realize that I, I, I need to work for myself again, you know, that I'm an entrepreneur at heart, and so I just took it. You know, it's not, it just is what it is. And, um, and so I couldn't take the $1,500 commission. I, it was his company, it was his sale. And, and so I found another customer that I had been talking to, a prospect, a company called Architectural Lighting. And here I am, sleeping in the shithole with no job and desperate. Um, but I convinced this, this company, Architectural Lighting, there was a piece of software that I wanted to sell them for 500 bucks, and I told them it cost me 250 and that I would make it work and train them on it and support them if they would loan me the 250 to, to buy the software up front. And if it didn't work for whatever reason, I'd walk their dogs, clean their cars, you know, scrub their toilets, whatever it took to pay them back. And fortunately, it worked, and that led to another customer, which led to another customer. That was a company called Microsolutions. Um, over the next seven years, I didn't take a vacation, taught myself how to program, taught myself you know, more about technology, that, uh, networking, than I thought I would ever know. And we grew to, you know, give or take 36 million in sales, 80 employees, and I sold it back, you know, 1990, I guess, um, <laughs> Time flies um, for $6 million, but for, you know, a 29, 30-year-old kid, that was real money. And, and so um, then it's big money. And not that it's not now, it really is, but it's just, but it, it, to get from the time of getting fired to getting to 80 employees and 36 millions in sales, literally not one vacation. Not yeah, let's talk, talk about the hustle required, because I think a lot of people, um, dream about being an entrepreneur mm -hmm. and want to be an entrepreneur conceptually but don't understand the time and commitment and the, and the sacrifice necessary to be able to outwork everybody to get to that side. Right? Yeah. And so even getting those seven years, if you added up all the time on an hourly basis, and yes, you sold the company in 1990 for six million dollars and netted a couple million bucks for, into your own pocket, but it was not just about, you weren't trying to get to that amount of money. You were, you were trying no. to do your own thing. Yeah, I mean. And so talk about the what's required for oh entrepreneurs and the hustle to, to get to that other side. You know, I, I learned, I mean, first of all, one, I had nothing to lose, right? I'm in the shithole. <laughs> I mean, how bad can it be? I mean, another quick story. So I didn't have money for a car, and my, my X19 with the hole in the floorboard had died. And so I literally, the way I got my car was I saw a car that was stranded on the side of the road, this old Camaro. And I forget exactly how, but I figured out how, which bank had, had put the money up for it for somebody to buy. And I called the bank and I said, would you let me pick up the payments on this? You know, only I need you to lower the payments down a little bit. And they said, yes. So I, I had this, you know, 1980-something um, Trans Am that I was able to use, but the point being that you just have to do things you never think you're going to have to do in order to, to survive and get through it. Um, you know, th those first couple months, I remember thinking to myself, I'm in business two months now. You know, I, I remember getting to the point where I had $15,000 in sales probably six months into the company and I'm still living in the shithole and thinking, okay, I can do this, I can do this. And along the way, it was, it was lots of trial and error. You know, there were things that were new to me, things that were terrifying to me, things that would just, I would break out into a sweat. But I always remember going into my customers and just trying to be bl brutally honest and say to them, if I can help you, right, if I can bring value, if I can make your company more competitive, more profitable, will you work with me? And you don't have to put money, I'll do the work to prove it, um, and if I get it done, then we'll, you know, we'll figure it all out. You know, or they agree to a price and then they'll pay it at that point. And one by one, I just kept on making customers happy. And lost some, picked, you know, for every one I lost, picked up three. And I, got, I was so nervous about the whole thing that you know, I just I couldn't imagine slowing down. You know? And so people talk about you know, life, family, balance. I had none. I mean, I literally remember dating some girl, and this is the truth. 
Um, and it was like, we, we'd been dating a couple years. And like, Mark, you're so into your work. I mean, I want a picket fence. I want a house. I want kids. You know, I mean, you, it's me or your job. And I was like, or me, and your, me or your company. And I was like, what's your name again? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, if you don't know me well enough by now after <laughs> dating two years to know that I'm driven on this, I mean, there was no balance. And that's not, look, today it's different, obviously, and depending on how old you are and your circumstances, you've got to try to figure all that out. But the one thing I kept on telling myself is everybody's trying to kick my ass, right? There's nobody giving this to me. There's nobody that's just saying, come on, Mark, this is all yours. Um, you know, there were customers I'd show up at one in the morning because that was the only time I could fit it in. There were times when I was doing software <laughs> and I gained probably 30 pounds because as I'm learning the program, I literally would go to KFC and buy a bucket of ribs and I'd sit there eating and programming and it'd be like 20 hours later when I stopped. And I thought I'd been there for two or three hours. It's just focused so hard and that's just part of the price you pay. And, you know, it's just... That's just reality. For all these amazing entrepreneurs that are here, you know, there's somebody out there. It could be a 12-year-old girl. It could be an 80-year-old man trying to kick your ass and take that business from you. And, and that's the way I always looked at it. And that competitive side of me always took over, and that's what drives me to this day, the competitive side. In 1995, you started to, um, which is interesting because you've taken this path all the way through, both with audio and video. Yep and television, and well, I was going to say audio and video in particular. But you started a company, or helped to fund a company called Audio, audio, Net, yeah. audio Net. So tell us about Audio Net and then how Audio Net became, what it became. broadcast, sure. and then ultimately that dot com, I'm going to ask you about the dot com sure. you know, boom, and then the dot com burst. Um, so and think your timing of that. Think back 23 years ago, people didn't know what streaming was. I mean, it's hard to conceive now, particularly if you're young, but it's like, I, one time, you know, as you know, I went to Indiana, and in Dallas in the mid-90s, you know, when, when we had a good basketball team, we'd, we literally would, when we wanted to listen to our, our big games like Indiana, Purdue, go Hoosiers, um, we would call somebody in Bloomington who would put a radio next to a speakerphone and dial us and we'd sit on the other side listening over a speakerphone drinking our beer and whooping it up or doing whatever and the internet was just starting to happen and now I'm a tech geek and I'm like into all of it and we're like there's got to be a better way to do this and so one of my buddies from Indiana Todd Wagner was like look we've been thinking about this and I'm like no I'll figure it out I'm a networking guy now and so we look for ways to um, stream Indiana basketball, we called it netcasting back then, over the brand new internet. And so I went out and bought a Packard Bell 90 megahertz computer and an ISDN line and downloaded all this software. And I said, you know what, I'm going to figure it out. And lo and behold, by, oh golly, early 1995, we had figured out a way to, um, we, would, we took these eight hour VCRs and connected it to a local radio station, record them, we'd bring them back, go through this process called encoding, and put it up on this website we called AudioNet. And then I'd go to any online forum, AOL, Prodigy, CompuServe, UUNet, whatever it was, or UUNet, and I like, if you're interested in Dallas sports at all, because we hadn't gotten to Indiana yet, if you're interested in Dallas sports, go to this website, AudioNet. And back then, you had a dial-up modem, you had to download this software called TCP IP, and you had to have software from your internet provider, which meant that so few people knew how to use it, we had no idea if it would work or not. But all of a sudden, AudioNet went from 10 people a day to 100 people to 1,000 people a day. And as we added radio stations, they're getting calls from all over the world from people who are listening to their shows on demand, not even live. And then we worked with a company that put together live software, a company called Zing, and we made it live, and then everything changed. And that's really when streaming was born, and we just grew that. And then in 1998, we got into video, changed the name to broadcast.com, went public, and it was the biggest IPO in the history of the stock market at the time. Um, and then we sold it to, to Yahoo. So your timing was pretty good, though. Yeah, the timing was really good. Because you sold broadcast.com 
for $5.7 billion to Yahoo. In stock now. It wasn't in stock. It, it was in stock. It wasn't in cash. But you cash. also did something very unusual. You yeah. collared it all. You collared it with a hedge. Right. So explain to the audience what that was and why you did so that. So we sold it for $5.7 billion in stock. And, you know, by that time, let's see, it was 1999, early 2000, I'd been in the tech industry for 15 years. And I had seen these companies and these themes come and go. Like, you know, when I started my first company, it was local area networks, and we did a great job with local and then wide area networks. And there were these companies, Wellfleet, Synoptics, that went like this and came charging down. Software companies, the old WordPerfects and WordStars, and I, whoop, boom, crashed. PC companies, whoop, crashed. I'm like, I don't need to watch this story play out again with my money. And so I went to uh, my broker and I said, you know, we can't just sell it all at once because I had a six month holdup. And so I literally took every penny that I had and bought an index, a shorted an index actually, that was the, the internet index that said, if the internet stock market crashed before I could sell my stock, then I would make money off this index. Well, I ended up losing $25 million on that deal, which was good, believe it or not, because that meant I'd lasted my six months and I could put a collar where I could slowly sell out all my shares and protect myself in case the market crashed by buying lots of puts and selling lots of calls, which I did. And so after the deal closed, within three months after my, my, my short ended, the internet market just started to crater. And you know, despite all these people I told, even people in the company, I mean, when I sold the company, we had 330 employees, 300 of them became millionaires on paper. And if they did what I told them to do, they not only stayed millionaires, they made even more money. Unfortunately, not all did. Um, but that's how I was able to protect it, protect the, the stock that I got from Yahoo, and then eventually turn it into cash. And it was called, it's been called one of the top 10 trades of all time in the stock market. No question. <clears throat> So you're, at this point, you're 42 years old. Yep. And, and I'm still 42, by the way. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> you just certainly look it. Of oh, course. I appreciate it. Um, you're 42 years old. You've got this money in your pocket. Yep. You're in Dallas. Yep. And somehow or another, you get the idea, or the, this team is available. The Dallas Mavericks are available. It wasn't available yet. Or you made it, you... Made it available. You, you made it available. Yeah. Um, but interestingly enough, you bought it from, I guess it was from Ross, Ross Perot, Perot Jr. Jr. Yep. And you paid what at the time seemed like an outrageous sum. It was an outrageous sum, yeah. $285 million. It was the highest price ever paid for a sports team of any sport of any kind at the time. And people thought I was just a flaming idiot. Right. You totally lost your mind. I totally lost my mind. You know, something happened, too many whatever, too many drinks, and it was over. So that's in 2000. Yep. And... As we've seen in 2015 and 16, teams were sold for $2 billion. Not enough. NBA team, not enough. Not enough. Still not enough. Still not enough. So tell me, um, but what you brought to the NBA, which was interesting, is a maverick, no pun intended yeah. on the word, but you were young, uh, brash, um, single. You were close to the age of some of the players. Yep, close enough. Um, and you certainly didn't hold your, your tongue when it came to talking about what the league needed to do to change. Nope, I used to tell David Stern, who was the commissioner of the NBA, that NBA stood for nothing but attorneys. And, he, and, just, and <laughs> just, bam. And you know, it cost me some money, but um, it was worth it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it did. It cost you a little bit of money, yeah, but it was, million, worth, it, was it was worth, worth it. clearing your mind. You know, facts Absolutely. matter. It, I mean, maybe not in politics today, but I thought even back then. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back to the politicians in a minute. But uh, you did really change the game. And when I say change the game, change the league in many ways, in a very positive way. Uh, many NBA players who I know or, pl or friends with at that time, um, you said, I'm going to take care of my team. Yep. I'm going to take care of my guys. I'm gonna, we're going to have the best in class of everything the best locker room, the best plane, yep. the best of everything. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, t 
to be one of the top 450 players in the world at anything, let alone, and in this case, basketball, you don't just get there by accident. It, it takes heart, it takes soul, it takes effort. Genetics, too, but even there's lots of gifted athletes that, as you know, didn't get anywhere close. And when I got to the Mavericks, the only award the Mavs had won was being voted the worst professional sports franchise of the 90s. And, and so it was a mess. They literally spent more money on computer repairs than we did on player development and on player health. And to me, that was the craziest thing ever. But as it turns out, nobody in the NBA did. And so I remember um, talking to our coach, Don Nelson, back then and others in the organization saying, okay, we're, sp we're paying this guy two, three, four million dollars, and we're just leaving it up to him to go work on his own to improve his game. That's stupid. So I put out a call, and, and we got brought back all kinds of former Mavs, Rolando Blockman, Brad Davis, you know, Derek Harper, and, and others, to come in and say, you know, you guys are now our player development coaches. And we had 15 players, and we had probably 10 development coaches. And the whole league laughed at me. I remember going to um, NBA owners meetings and the other owners were like, <laughs> you know, or, you know, what are you doing? You're out of your mind. And, you know, all the sports writers would write articles. This guy has no clue what he's doing. He should just sit up in the owner's box and shut up and, and let the basketball gurus do what they do. And I'm like, I don't care what you say. I don't care what you do. You know, this is what I know is the right thing to do. And now, you know, all these years later, Every team has got huge, you know, player development staffs, and they, they realize that, you know, you draft a player, you trade for a player, you sign a player. It's your job to get the most out of them in coordination with the player. And so those types of things were, were unheard of back then. You know, the idea, when I started with the NBA, they thought their product was basketball. And this applies to entrepreneurs um, very much so. You got to know what your product is. Microsolutions, my product was profitability using technology to generate profitability. At broadcast.com, it was our ability to make the world smaller. Even though we broadcast radio stations, those were proof of concepts so that corporations could do, you know, we, Intel would pay us hundreds of thousands, even millions of dollars so that they could broadcast stream their product introductions in five languages around the world, things they weren't able to do prior to that. So we made the world smaller. With the Mavs, we didn't sell basketball. We sold fun. We sold experiences, and I, and I would go to the NBA owners' uh, meetings, and I'd say, okay, what was the score of your last game? Who, you know, do you remember this jump shot from your last game? And like, no. And then I'd say, okay, do you remember the first game you went to with your mom or your dad? Do you remember the first game you took your son or your daughter or your niece or your nephew to? That game you went to with a girlfriend or your wife or your buddies? Oh, yeah, da, da. that's what we sell. We sell experiences, and those experiences have to be affordable, and those experiences have to, to be made special. And so, you know, I brought in music because what I learned early on was when a parent brought their 10-year-old or 8-year-old, that 8-year-old is looking like this, you know, whenever there's not action going on, and so I had to keep them engaged. And all these things were completely foreign to the NBA, and they just thought I was an idiot. But, you know, as I've learned over the years that every time someone thinks I'm an idiot, I'm good. Um. <laughs> what, what was in, in the 18 years you've now had the team? God damn. Right, which, um, now you went from being the young gun to now you're one of the, let's call it more young seasoned. Gun, older yeah. young guns, right. yeah. What was your greatest disappointment and what was your greatest thrill in these 18 years that you've owned the team? I mean, the, losing 2006 and winning in 2011 um, in terms of basketball. It, you know, it, the thing about professional sports in particular, there's no other business. App, Apple Computer, biggest company by market cap in the, the universe, they have their best quarter ever. No one throws a parade at Cupertino. What? You know, Google, doesn't matter what they do, no one's throwing a parade. Mavs win. Half a million people lined the streets, but along the way, the whole city, like when the Panthers were on their run, right? You know, the whole city catches on fire and everybody's talking about it. You can feel it and it just takes everybody's attention away from their day-to-day -day life. And it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter what you do, you know, everybody comes together. 
And just watching that happen, when, particularly with, with our 2011 run, it was like no one expected it. I'd be lying if I said I expected it, you know. And then we got closer and closer. And then the, the anticipation and the stress levels just build up because all these years we've gotten close and lost. And I'm like, oh, something, you know, you just don't want to let yourself think it's going to happen. And then you get there. And I'll never forget, there's 30 seconds left in the game. And, and I still get emotional thinking about it. And, you know, Jason Terry hits a shot and we go up 11. And finally, I'm just like, oh, shit. <laughs> this is going to happen. And I, that's when I wouldn't let myself celebrate until then. It was that moment that I finally let go. And that moment itself was the best moment of owning the Dallas Mavericks. No question. Yeah, it's, it's good. Coincidentally, or maybe not so coincidentally, in 2011, you also joined Shark Tank. Yep, 2010, yep. After having won the NBA championship, and yep. now you join Shark Tank, which in many ways, is a, this is like a huge Shark Tank audience. Uh, it really is. Audience. It really is. Um, but tell us about having gone to Shark, going, having gone to Shark Tank. Um, I think, if I read it correctly, in the last six years or seven years, you've invested in 85 companies yep. and over almost $20 million, over 20 million. To, to these companies. So tell us about how um, the idea of them coming to you for Shark Tank and how and what it's yeah. meant to you and, and, and the opportunities you've given entrepreneurs yeah, over the period of time. those are good questions. Um, first of all, people watch the show. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> well, good. And the first thing I'll tell you, however big a jerk you think Kevin O'Leary is, He's a bigger one. Um, <laughs> Mark Burnett put together in the United States. It actually is, the, is a concept that started in Japan and then went to the United Kingdom called Dragon's Den. And then Mark Burnett brought it to the U.S. and turned it into Shark Tank. And I originally talked to him about it the first season, and they didn't cast me. And then I came back in the second season as a guest. And honestly, when I went on the show, it, they had bounced it around to different nights, and I'm thinking, this business show has got no chance of surviving. And so I go on there, do my three episodes as a guest, and I'm just buying every company no matter what. Because <laughs> I'm thinking, this thing's gone, and I, I'm like, I want to I make my mark on this TV show, because this is ABC, it's network television. I'm like, and you know, Kevin, and Damon, and Barbara, um, and Robert, they're looking at me like I'm crazy. It's just like when I went to the NBA, right? <laughs> they're like, what the hell are you doing? I'm like, you know, let's just have some fun. And the next thing you know, the show starts taking off and it really starts getting a base of viewers. And now we start next week, a week from today, we start shooting season 10. But along, the, yeah, which is cool. Could you imagine, for me, eight seasons of Mr. Wonderful? It's brutal, brutal. But the good part about it is that, you know, so many companies have come on there and we've picked some and missed some. And, you know, I've invested, as you said, in 85, but I think now we're up to seven of those that have sold. We just sold a company out of Atlanta um, that went on Shark Tank as Cycloramic. They had the, the um, iPhone that used the buzzer and you ran this um, app on it and it just turned around and did a panoramic version of the phone, of, took panoramic pictures. Well, they changed the format of the iPhone, which is great. This is a great lesson for entrepreneurs, right? So this guy came in with this really cool app, worked with an iPhone 5, and it just turned around and take panoramic pictures and then stitch them together, and it was a cool picture. Well, not, so I give him $250,000, I think, for 20% of the company or 25% of the company. Not four months later, Apple changes the iPhone. And it's got this like rounded thing underneath, and we're like, oh, what's, what are we going to do? But the guy was smart. And one of the things I always look for for companies coming in is what's your unique advantage? What is the one thing you have that differentiates you from other companies? And for this guy, the product was interesting, but you know, as I said on the show, the ability to, to program video and use what became computer vision was a unique skill that was hard to find. And so we worked with him and actually brought it, worked with him to bring in another CEO. 
and they use that same technology to be able to scan cars. So now if you go to websites like Carvana to buy a car and you see how you can turn the car around just right there, that started with their software. And the guy's name is Bruno. So Bruno, we just sold his company for $22.5 million a couple weeks ago. And so I walked away with 25% you know, of that. So I was like, yeah, Shark Tank. <laughs> Bring me some more Shark Tank. But the, the point of it is, all these companies come on, and there's some rules of thumb that, that I thought were smart going in, but have really turned out to be true moving forward. One is sales cures all. Lots of companies come in and say, I have a great idea, or I have a company, and we've got some sales, but we only need to do this, and we only need to do that. And you talk to them, and you talk to the entrepreneur, and I'm like, why aren't you selling? This is your whole company. There's never been a company in the history of companies to to survive without sales. And so I think, you know, now as more and more people watch Shark Tank, they're seeing it, but if you can't sell, if it's your company and you can't sell, you're not gonna be in business long, particularly when you're starting up and it's just you. And sales is not something you can give to somebody else and say, okay, I'm just gonna hire salespeople. Michael Humecki, remember that guy I told you about that fired me for handing him the check? He was the guy who wouldn't, he was the CEO and owner. He would never sell. He thought he could just bring us in and sell it and the company failed afterwards, you gotta sell. And so there are principles like that, you know. The other thing is when people get some momentum, they wanna all of a sudden go big, right? Particularly that's kind of a dot-com thing. Let's buy our customers, raise a ton of money. Well, one of, one of my buddies, Howard Tallman, says it best. He goes, you gotta nail it before you scale it. If your company doesn't work, making it big won't solve your problems, it'll just add to your problems. Another thing that we try to convey, or I, I've learned and try to convey to our Shark Tank companies, is that raising money always seems to be like the big thing to entrepreneurs coming in. Well, if I can only raise this money, raising money isn't an accomplishment, it's an obligation. The best equity is sweat equity. You know, what you can do and what you, seriously, if you're, putting in the, if you're putting in the sweat and you're putting in the time and you're not out there raising money and you're grinding it out and you're hustling, then you deserve to give yourselves a hand because that's what it's all about. Because if you don't do that, it's not gonna work. So many companies, I mean, and to me, that's part of the problem of Silicon Valley. You know, they're so all about raising money, raising money, and they forget. That just creates an obligation. And when I give you my money in Shark Tank, what is this just like, okay, here's your 100 grand, call me when you're, you know, you're not so busy. No, I, I gave it to you for a reason, right? And I, I have expectations, and I want, to, I want you to communicate with me, and I wanna know that you're, you're I'll, I'll tell you, <laughs> for, you know, if, if I was a normal distribution, I've had some really great companies and I've had just some pure out idiots. Just, and it's almost like drafting, you know, in the second round of the NBA. Athletes will come in and just give you the best song and dance and you think they've got it together. Um, <laughs> I had this one company and they did these, so I try to get people to paint their faces to come to Mavs games. And you know, kids will put on paint, you know, but when you're done with it, it's a mess. And so this company, um, Game Face, they had these things, they got surgical tape, and they had them reformatted so that you could just cut it up, color whatever colors or pre-buy the colors you like, and just poke the holes and cut, cut them, and put them on your face, and when you're done, you know, you look all, you know, Mavs colors, whatever, you just peel it off and you're done. It was great. We did some tests. We got Dr. Pepper to put their logo there. Awesome. Awesome. Kids loved it. 10,000 went out the door. They were cheap to make. And so the, the guy, um, oh, I forget his name. But all of a sudden one day I'm getting a report. So the way I like to do it is I like to get weekly, depending on how good the company is, weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, or quarterly. You know, the better the company, the longer you can wait. But I always want bad news first. Because I, I invested in you because I expect good news. But when there's a problem, I want to know about it because I want to be able to help you and get it through it. And so um, with, with Game Face, I got my reports, and all of a sudden the money was gone. I'm like, what would you spend all this money on? It's gone. And he decided we needed, for the surgical tape, you know, mask, he decided we needed patents all around the world to protect it. I'm like, dude, you've, you've barely sold anything. What are you protecting? <laughs> which, which is another rule of thumb, right? Oh, I gotta get a patent, I gotta get a patent. I get, you don't need a patent. 
There's no good reason to pat, patent something that sucks. <laughs> but if you can't sell it, right, then you know it sucks. If you can sell it, then you can talk about it, right? But, so in this case, it wasn't that it sucked. It was actually a good product, but the guy went through all of the money. I'm like, so what are you going to do now? I don't know. We'll start small. I'm like, look, we I got them together, sitting there drinking iced tea. I'm like, I'm going to do you a favor. I own 33% of the company. I'm going to take over and run it. All you have to, you can go get another job. You can hang out with your kids. I'm not going to let, you don't have to do anything and please don't do anything. I've got my 33%. I think this can be big enough. Just seeing what I could see was, you know, going to sporting events and, you know, the World Cup was coming and things we could do there and selling sponsors. Just chill, right? Here's a beer. I'll send you beer. Whatever you need, just chill. <laughs> so we shake on it. And so um, we're grinding it out, right? And sales are going, ch -ch 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 And I'm like, okay, this is working. Six months later, I get an email from one of my guys. You're not going to believe what he did. I'm like, what did he do? He, he created his own newgameface.com or whatever it was to compete with me. I'm like, are you shitting me? It's just like, you know, look, as an entrepreneur, you guys are entrepreneurs. You, you've got to have a screw loose. You got to be a little freaky somewhere along the line. That's just the nature of the beast because it's so competitive and there's so much at stake. But uh, <laughs> come on, man. It was just like, <laughs> so they run the gamut. Well, but I think <laughs> the, the, some of the lessons you put through this are important with the focus on sales first because I, I you know, <clears throat> my father would say to me all the time, the harder I work, the luckier you get. Yep. And he said, there's no, there's, no, there's no trade secrets in this. This is just, you have to outwork the competition, whoever yep. anybody else is that stands in your way. Um, and you don't even have to necessarily, you know, I think about entrepreneurs today, and I think about my dad at the time. You know, he, didn't, he knew nothing about media, knew nothing about publishing. The only thing he knew is that he, he said, I have three hungry kids at home, I got to speed. So I just have to work harder than everybody else and yep. sell it. Yep. And I think the sales part, which I'd like you to stay on it for a moment, really is the most important element for an yes, entrepreneur yes, because, yes, you know, yes, if I had a yes. dollar for everyone who brought me an idea without a plan behind it, you know, we, had a, we have a private equity firm that we, uh, you know, fund that we were running and that we would invest in folks. And they would spend all the time telling about this plan, but never give you the thing about how you had to sell. And that's like, well, if you're the CEO, you're in charge, you have to be the number one salesperson. Always. No right. exceptions. You've got to like, be the number one salesperson. So, I always say to people, if you come up with an idea where you say, I can make dollar bills for 50 cents, would you go out and raise money or would you just go out and sell it? You just go out and do it, you know, and, and that's what you have to do. And look, we all go through that fear factor of, do I quit my job? Do I, can I do this? Um, can, I, can I do this and what happens next? The one thing I, I know with 100% certainty and what I would tell myself is, if I can sell and become a better and better salesperson and be great at selling, I'm always going to be successful whether I'm working for myself or if the company that I started just didn't work. I'll, t I'll give you an example. Um, out of Indiana, um, before I, I went down to Dallas, I, I needed to start something. And um, I decided that everybody drank milk and I found this product, powdered milk that was cheaper and everybody needed to save money. And I was going to go out there and sell it um, because it was cheaper. Now, it didn't taste quite as good. <laughs> and so what I've, but I went out there to try to sell it. Failed miserably. But I learned how to make the sales effort even when things weren't going right. I learned that the rejection was, every no got me closer to a yes that not every product was perfect, but I could take those same skills, even in failure, and translate them. So that what I learned selling garbage bags door to door, what I learned from selling powdered milk that was awful, what I learned from selling local area networks at Micro Solutions, 
all those things accumulated and I, I got better at selling. So I always knew, you know, people always say to me, if you lost everything, what would you do? I can sell. I can sell. And it's not about selling ice to Eskimos. It's not about, you know, convincing people to do this. Selling is always about helping. Selling is always about understanding the person you're talking to and what their needs are. And if someone can help me make my life easier, yeah. People, you know, now with employees, people always say, well, like, what's the definition of a great employee? Someone who can reduce the stress of those around them. And it's the same thing. What's the definition of a great salesperson? Someone who can reduce the stress of their salespeople. And if in looking at your company and looking at your, your life and looking at your goals, if you're able to go out there and recognize that whether it works or doesn't work, you're putting yourself in a position where you're helping somebody, not convincing somebody, but, and you're reducing their stress, you're going you're gonna to be okay. It's going to work out. And, you know, that's the confidence I, I've, I've built in myself that wasn't necessarily always there. Um, but I learned that if I try to help, if I reduce people's stress, good things can happen. You have always been viewed as brutally honest, brutally frank. <laughs> sometimes, worse, to your, yeah. sometimes to your detriment. At, um, I don't really think it's your detriment. I think it's just you being brutally honest. Yep. And going back to the NBA, when you know, with the referee, you know, with the referees, and I forgot the guy's name. I think it was Ed. Uh, Ed oh, Rush. Ed Rush. Ed Rush. Ed Rush. Yeah. And um, you said he might be the worst. No, I said he couldn't hire. Man, I wouldn't hire in the manager of Dairy Queen. That's right. You wouldn't hire in the manager of Dairy Queen. So Dairy Queen called you and said you couldn't run the store. So you went over to Dairy, and they hired you for the day to run over Dairy Queen. Um, so which, and I know to this day, I know to this day, if you want to make a Dairy Queen swirl, you do nine, one, seven with the comment. Nine, one, seven. <laughs> so, you, so you did it. Learned something new, huh? <laughs> now it was worth all the money. Um, but the league has changed. Yep. The world is, I mean, the, the world has changed, but the league has changed. I mean, because now you, there was a time you were drafting and bringing in seasoned players. Mm -hmm. Now you're, you're taking a chance, yes. basically somewhat rolling the dice on some kid, generally eight, 19 years old or 20 years old. Yep. And, but there are always one or two who are kind of like the best, right? I mean, they're, when I say the best, they are obvious candidates. Yep. And there's been a lot of discussion. Um, they're trying to adjust and change it towards making sure the teams don't tank. Right. Right. You so, you famously, so you famously said back in February 2018, um, well, shoot, I mean, if I want to get the best opportunity. Okay, then, there's, there's a well, back story there. But, but, yeah, explain, yeah. but explain, so since you were fined $600,000 for it anyway, you, know, that, gives you the, that gives you the opportunity. And I had to, to talk explain. them down for more. Right. So. <laughs> explain what you were saying okay. and, why, and what is really going so on. So there's, there's two things going on here. One, our season wasn't going as planned. Um, and I had to be honest with our players, you know, because the difference between winning five more, 10 more, 15 more games and not winning those games is the difference between getting what we have now, the fifth pick or the ninth or 10th or 11th pick, which the, you know, the higher in the draft the, or the, the lower the pick, right, the higher the number, the less likely you are to draft an all-star. Now, there's no guarantees if you have a fifth pick or even first pick, you're going to get an all-star quality player, but your odds are improved. And so our goal at, at the Dallas Mavericks is to win championships. And I sat down with a bunch of our players and went to dinner with them and said, look, this is the reality. Our best option is to lose. Hold that right there. <laughs> now, they understood, right? They're not stupid. They, look, they want to win championships. It's not win 35 games, win 40 games. Okay, now what do we accomplish? But if we can put ourselves on a path towards a championship, they understand, and that's what they want to be part of, and they recognize there's, there's pain to get that game. So hold that. All-Star, February of 2018, I get a request to be interviewed by Julius Irving. Now, Julie, growing up in Pittsburgh, there wasn't an NBA team. The closest team was Philly. Julius Irving was my idol, my basketball idol as a kid. Literally, if you, if you all remember this old movie, The Fish That Saved Pittsburgh, they filmed that in Pittsburgh when I was a kid, and I took a bus 
and went like however many changes of my bus, the bus, I mean, that, I took a bus everywhere back then, but, um, and, that, and I went to watch it just to see Dr. J. When I got to go to my first NBA All-Star game after I bought the team, it was in Philly, and I have a picture of Dr. J standing about where the lectern is over there, and me right here, and I get someone to take it just so I can be in the same picture of Dr. J. <laughs> And so I'm sitting there with Dr. J doing his podcast, and I'm just like a fangirl, right? You, you know. <laughs> and so we're talking about being in, he's asking me questions like you are, and he's talking about being, you know, an owner's, a player's owner. And not even thinking, I'm like, yeah, I had, a, you know, a, a conversation where I told our players our best option is to lose. Bam. That's what it took, and that got out. And then it became, Mark Cuban says, the Mavs are tanking, which was true. And if I hadn't, you know, said it that way, it would have been okay because there's eight other teams that were tanking too. Um, but yeah, so I got hit for a lot of money. Um, is what it is. What do you think the solution w is? What do you, if, you know, if you were suddenly put in the commissioner's seat, what do you think the, the, the solution is to make what, what I the... Would say, yeah. I don't think we have to change it all that much. What I would tell you is the team with the worst record can't get better than the fourth pick, and the team with the second worst record can't get better than the fifth pick, and then you have the lottery for the rest. And so that, so all of a sudden, come the end of the season, if it's looking like you're going to have the worst record, you have no chance to get the first pick. Second worst record, you have no chance to get the second best pick. You're, you're going to play, and you're going to play hard, and you're going to make trades because you have to win. Otherwise, you lose the opportunity, and then you let all the other teams do um, the lottery the way they do it now. So that's what I would have suggested, but they don't always listen to me. Maybe they should. Though. I tell them that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Let's switch the conversation you to politics for a moment. Oy. Um, you have uh, been rumored uh -huh. to... Uh, in many ways, I think would, would be positive. I'm sure this audience would agree with this, but um, it's demonstrated now that you can be just about anything and become president, president of the United States. For better or worse. For yeah. better or for worse. Um, and you've been very vocal critic mm -hmm. of uh, President Trump. So tell us what your thoughts are, not so much about beating up on the, the president, but right. what you see is happening in this country that is dividing this country, in my view, uh, the divisive politics, the right. divisive conversations about everything, that what's happening with, and this is happening with both um, Democrats and Republicans, sure. it's happened with, and it is starting to bring out other things, that, with men and women and all the above. So tell me your thoughts in regards to what you're seeing in this political landscape and whether or not you would actually really consider but would I let me do that part? It. Would I consider it? Yes. Do I know I'm going to do it? I mean, I'm not close to saying yes, but it's something I'll consider because you know that I have three kids, eight, eleven, and fourteen. The older two are girls and a boy, and you know the definition of, of being an awful parent is running for president when you have kids that age, and it's such a great age. I, I just don't w want to put them through it unless I have to, and so we're not to that point yet. But in terms of what's going on in the country. You know, I think America works best when we're Americans first. You know, that we all are going to be who, are, who we are, our race, our ethnicity, you know, where we came from. And we're always going to be proud of that, and we're always, always, always going to recognize that. But when that's our only identity, and it becomes kind of a, our team, almost like our sports team, and, and then that's, we, that tribalism starts to pull us apart. But when we think about who we are, we're 99% the same. We're nine, whether you, you can come from the United States, you, you, you know, you're an immigrant, your parents were immigrants, however you got here, we're 99% we're the same. And I think it takes leadership to get us to recognize that. We want all our fellow Americans to succeed. We want all our fellow Americans to get along. We don't want to wake up in the morning, every morning, feeling stress about what's going on in the world, you know? And so I think rather than, if, if I were to run, the impetus would be you can't be a Republican 
you can't be a Democrat because those, that, that tribalism is as bad as any other tribalism. You know, that's, that's separating us as much as anything. But you can be an American, you can be independent of those and just try to do the right things. And, you know, and I think that starts with leadership and that leadership starts with everybody deserves respect. Everybody, no exceptions. Everybody deserves opportunity, no exceptions, right? Everybody needs to be treated as an American, that is an American citizen or legally here, needs to be treated as such. And we need, and for those who, you know, have issues, aren't here, we need to care and figure it out. You don't throw people under the bus because they don't fit who you think they should be. And so I think there's, you know, we get so caught up in, in the news and we get so caught up in, you know, what our president does or doesn't do and that just gets us all torqued up. When in reality, it's somebody, whether it's me or somebody else, it doesn't matter. Somebody needs to say, we're all Americans first. We all deserve opportunity. We all deserve respect, with respect probably being first and foremost. And if Americans care for each other, we can do things together. That's what makes America special. We ha Look, we're all entrepreneurs here. You're all here because you want to create. You're all here because you believe the American dream is still alive and well. You're all here because you want a better life for your family. And when we do these things together and when we come together, those things can happen. Now, there's no perfect candidates. There's no perfect solutions. God, I'm sounding like a politician, aren't I? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but this is, just what, this is just what I feel. And it's just, you know, it's just, we, we don't, we just need somebody that says, put aside the Democrats, put aside the Republicans. You guys had your shot. Now it's time for a new America. Let's all come together. And look, even the furthest left and the furthest right, you know, there's so many commonalities that we, we can gather around and respect that makes this country great. And I mean, I just think that can pull us together as opposed to, no, this is my, it's worse than sports, you know? It's like, oh, how many rings do you have? Or your team, or your team sucks, or your team sucks. That's what we're turning into. You know, it's like we're all bandwagoners in, in, in some political or some tribe. And I, I just think that that's wrong. And, and if we can get past that, it, with whether it's me or whoever it is, there's still greatness in this country. We don't need to make it great again. It is great. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I'd love to see you lead the Common Sense Party. Um, but you know what? And that, rather that, than the... Th know. That's interesting, though, right? Because it brings the question, do you create another party? And the reality is you can't. You know, you can't create another party. You have to get individuals, communities, groups standing up and saying, we're doing this because it's the right thing to do. It's not come join my party and get away because then you're just another party, right? Do it as individuals. Individuals need to stand up. Families need to stand up. Communities need to stand up and do what they think is right. And one of the things I am doing and putting my money where my mouth is, um, one of the challenges that we have with politics is we don't always get the best candidates. And there's all kinds of rules that are established that say, if you want to run for a federal office and get on the ballot in the state of Texas, you have to go out there and literally get, I think the number is, and I'm not positive, but numbers like 57,000 signatures. What are you going to do, walk through Texas to get 57,000? Yes, people hire people to do that and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars just to get on the ballot, which means 99% of the best candidates can't get on the ballot. So we're working on getting some independent candidates and putting together some programs so that we can fight some of these laws and get them changed. It's not going to happen fast. It'll be a multi-year thing, but hopefully we'll be able to change the ballot access laws so the best candidates can get on, and it's not about parties because... The Republicans and the Democrats, it's to their benefit to, to make it bipartisan, you know, just to keep their candidates ahead of the game. And so, you know, hope, hopefully we'll be able to figure this out. And, you know, I'm happy to it. It strikes out. me strange, though, that you, you, all of these, these disruptions happening in politics, but yet the conversation continues oftentimes to be, if you watch... If you watch CNBC, CNN, and Fox, 
and you put them all on at the same, you know, at the same time to watch these different channels talking about the same exact issue, but completely different right. points of view. And then it always errors in, well, look how, look how well the stock market's doing. Look how much more money you have, despite the fact that it only impacts a very small percentage of people, right? In other words, so yeah. there's, it's the, the conversation, the country's doing great again. But, but yeah. the, the, there's more wealth than there ever has been. The, which, you know, which is true, right? Look, it's easy to rip on Trump, and there's things on, on a general basis, on a, a macro basis, the, com the country's doing better financially. But he's worried about the Chinese trade deficit and the Canadian trade deficit. I'm worried about the wallet deficit. You know, because even though, you know, unemployment's lower, not in every community. You know, there are places, I'm sure in Charlotte, in Texas, in, in California, has 10% plus unemployment. But your cost of health, look, us as entrepreneurs, we know when it comes to hiring somebody, it's not just about what wage we pay them, insurance or health care, and or competing with somebody else that offers it. There's the cost of rent, too damn high and going higher, right? There's other expenses, you know, cost of interest rates are now going up and cost of, you know, there's just our cost of tuition. You know, it's, it's interesting to me that we have $1.3 trillion in tuition that's owned by, by Americans. That's a 1.3 trillion, but the whole trade deficit with China is 375 billion. What should we worry about first? Now, I'm all for fair trade. Go negotiate, right? But let's not forget about the wallet deficit, right? The things that are costing all of us money. Look, I remember the day I paid off my student loan. <laughs> and I remember the day I got to throw away all the, the, the demand notices. And I remember the day, back in the day, when I got to turn my answering machine back on <laughs> because I was tired of getting those stupid messages. <laughs> Excuse me, Mr. Cuban, this is um, so-and-so from the... Pennsylvania State, yeah, you get the drill. And so there's, there are a lot of things that we can focus on that move, that focus on the needs of all Americans again. And again, it's not that what he's paying attention to is wrong. There's value there in negotiating those things and making them better, and you can make them better for the United States, but it's a question of priorities. And I think, you know, I think that's where he's gotten a little askew. I'm about to open it up. Uh, to the audience of questions, I, I wanted to uh, give you credit, too, to something that you have done with the Mavericks, um, which I think is extraordinary. Um, you know, a lot of organizations um, mean to do well, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes they, uh, they hit a blind spot, right? Yep. It's happened to you to all me. with the yep. Mavericks. It's happened to a lot of, number of organizations. I don't think people wake up in the morning and say, how can I find ways to exclude people, right? Right, or I want to, ex or not advance women, or do other things. We we have a um, we have a huge event that we put on every year called the Women of Power Summit, which continues to be one of our most um, highly sought after events. Um, but what you did with the Mavericks most recently, um, when you had this. Yeah, well, let, let's tell people problem. what happened. Look, you know. um, I had a CEO who I trusted to run the organization, and he, was, he ran the organization for 15 years and has been gone for three, and somebody accused him of sexual harassment. We had another individual that, um, was, that was involved with the sexual assault of an employee outside of work that didn't happen at work, and we had another employee that just was a mess. And we didn't handle it as an organization as well as we should. And, you know, a lot of the stuff, or all, almost all of it, I didn't know was going on. Not that that's an excuse, but I reckon, you know, once it was brought to my attention, it was like, it was, it was unacceptable that I had let my company as an entrepreneur, as an owner, get to this point. And I knew I had to fix it, and I knew I had to bring in a pro. And I, I was really ble blessed when I got connected to Sint Marshall. And so I know a lot of you know her, and it's easy just to say that Sint is a force of nature. <laughs> well, I'm not sure. See, but I'm, I'm, I'm not done. Uh, let me finish. Okay, yeah, let me finish okay. one thing. 
it's easy to say she's a force of nature um, because she is. But what I know now that I didn't know when I hired her is that she's a phenomenal manager. And we talked about all these things that I look at at Shark Tank for companies and what's important to me and then the same things that are important when I invest or when I start a company. And without me prodding her or suggesting things, bam, 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 I just watch her do all the right things. And not talking about posing or making it perception wise, sitting down with employees, dealing with issues, taking responsibility, putting people on a path towards you know, success, you know, helping under understanding you know, the goals of our employees and helping them reach their goals and helping them understand what it takes to get there. And if they can't, you know, being brutally honest and saying it's time to move on. So, Sint, wherever you are, you're amazing. Thank you. Well, you saved my life. What I was going to say is, um, for many of the people who don't know that, but the CEO of the Dallas Mavericks happens to be an African-American woman, and her name is Cynthia Marshall, and she's here. So I'd like Cynthia to stand, stand up, up and be recognized. And it says a lot about you because if I look around the other 31 teams, or 30, 29 teams, excuse me, um, they don't have an office that looks like your office. I mean, honestly, and I didn't care if Sint was purple. Right. Um, <laughs> she's just really, 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 really good. And to me, that's what's important. That, and what, I'm, what she's teaching me and what I'm, I'm learning, that you know, diversity is not just about, it's not just a word, and it's not just a body count. It's not just a checklist. It's, and it's not, only, not even about inclusion. It's about recognizing the skill set that somebody different than you brings to the table and putting, to, putting that to you. And honestly, honestly, I didn't know that before. I, before all this happened, I didn't know that. I thought, you, you know, if I treated you like I expected to be treated, then I was treating you equally, and that was good enough. But being, treating people equally is not, is not the same, is not recognizing who they truly are and taking advantage of their skills. You know, and I've, I've learned that through Sint, I've learned that through all this. And you know, like Sint and I talk, we'll be a much better organization. I'll be a better exec, I'll be a better investor, I'll be a better um, shark, um, because I recognize that you know, treating people equally is not the same as treating them, it, recognizing their skills and their differences. And for this, for this audience, it's, it's critically important. You know, and I think there's an opportunity now, and I know, hopefully you know, people like me will recognize that the old white guys, now newly old white guys that are in positions of power, that there are things that you can do that I can't do. That I, that there are things you see that I don't see. There are opportunities that you can create that I can't create. You know, we were trying to sell to the, the black community through the Mavs with multiple white men. We were trying to sell to moms with multiple white men. It's not that they're not capable. It's not that they're not skilled. It's just everybody brings something different to the table. And as an entrepreneur, you have to recognize what the differences are that you bring to the table. And you have to be brutally honest with yourself, right? You can't lie to yourself like we all lie to ourselves as entrepreneurs. But those differences can be part of your unique skill set, like I talked about earlier. And now I'm finally starting to recognize those things. And you know the one thing I know? It's going to make me a shitload more money. <laughs> OK. So we're going to open this up to some questions and answers. But let me be clear. I'm not looking for quanzers. <laughs> I'm stealing that one. Right. Oh, I'm, I'm looking for a question. And if you start down the path of giving us a sales pitch, I'm going to cut you off. Okay. So this is not the time, this is not a shark, this is not the elevator pitch competition. Oh, that's great. I want questions, not quanzers. Okay. Quanzers, I'm stealing that one. Good evening. Hear that shark uh, good evening, Mr. Mark Cuban. I drove six hours just to ask, to ask this question to you. My name is Stephen Price. Hey, Stephen. Um, you talked about companies having a, u a unique advantage. Can you speak more on that for me, please? Sure. I mean, what is it that, that a customer can get from you that they can't get from anybody else? And you have to be very careful with that, too. When I just talked about lying to yourself as an entrepreneur, 
because often we'll say, well, it's just like Uber, but it has pink cars. Uber doesn't have pink cars. That, that's a, a difference without a distinction, right? Lots of times people get confused between what's a product and what's a feature. Pink Uber cars, that's a feature. That's not a unique product. Excuse me, so you have to know what it is that you do that is so unique, people, the people, your potential customers say, whoa, I did not know that. As opposed to, well, let me go tell Uber that they should probably add pink cars. Because whenever you're competing with, you know, all of you are going to compete with Amazon at some point, if you're not already. Just the reality. And so you've got to understand, when Amazon starts looking at my customer base, what is it that I can convey to them that makes me unique? And that's, that's what I meant by unique difference. Hello, how are you? Hi. Good. I'm Saray Jackson. No, and I'm speak up, we can't hear you. I'm sorry, is that better? Yeah. My bad. So I'm Saray Jackson and I just recently saw a um, episode of Shark Tank where a lady was on there with bread pudding. Um, I make a graham cracker treat and everything I make is on a graham cracker. So, but eventually I want to be kind of like the next Annie Anne's or something like that in the malls across America. So you guys didn't make a deal with her um, and it was almost as if she couldn't kind of scale her business to be that big. So I was wondering if that's how you felt or like, it, because it, it's kind of niche a little bit. Okay, it was, it's niche. So that's, that's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Next question, please. <laughs> it was a niche. Uh, <laughs> Good evening. My name is Joyce Cooper, and I have a, what I would like to know is, as we build our businesses, should we think about building them to sell, or in my case, I would like to leave a legacy for my family for generations to come. So what advice do Wait, you give? What was give? the second part of it? I didn't understand. Should we, should we, when we build our businesses, should we look to build our businesses knowing that one day we may have to sell? Or in my case, I really would like to leave a legacy for generations to come. So what advice would you give someone like me? So don't think about the exit, okay. right? Just think about surviving and then keeping your customers happy and growing. If you're worried, if you're already spending the money you haven't made yet or have a vision for it, those are brain cycles that you're taking away from getting those first customers and making them happy. It's great to dream. I'm not saying don't, I'm the, I used to drive by the big houses with the hole in my floorboard and, and hope someday I can do that and use that as motivation. So it's great to dream, but you got to stay focused as much as possible. Thank you. Good luck. Hey, how you doing? My name I'm is Trey Jackson. Uh, I'm in the video production field. As you um, created your uh, broadcast TV company in the time that it was uh, the whole industry was, was emerging, so you did really well. Uh, I found that my industry, it's, you know, camera phones are taking over and uh, videographers are less valued. Like, what, looking for what kind of industry or what can make me unique in, the, in that field and how to leverage, like, in this, in this space of media is so everywhere, but... Uh, so, so I get that question all the time. So okay. what industry should I look at? I can, I can tell you all about artificial intelligence, computer vision, personalized medicine, but then what, right? And so, the, and maybe you, you're an expert in one of those fields and you can go for it, but what I, I tend to try to tell people in terms of what does it take to be successful? Find something you, you love to do and then be great at it. Not average, not marginal, not good enough, but if you can be great at it, be great at it. If you are the, the greatest videographer in the history of videographers, people don't care about cell phones. What is it that you can do that makes them know that what you, the way you do it is special? And if you can do that and convey it, then you'll be fine. If you're not sure, then you know, you've, got to, you've got to decide whether you want to stay on your own Get it, you know, be a contractor or go work for somebody, you know, it, it just depends. You know, and let me add one other thing. I, I crushed myself um, and like my brothers didn't. They, they took a completely different path and they were looking just nine to five at yada yada. Not everybody's got to be an entrepreneur. 
And so if, you, if you've got it in your blood and that's what you want to do, then find a way to be great. And if not, you know, you'll figure it out. You'll find something else. Hello. Hi. My name is Jillian Hyshaw. I'm an attorney. And how do you scale a nonprofit to be a for-profit when you're working in rural communities in high poverty areas? How do you scale a nonprofit to be a profit? For-profit. To be a for-profit when you're working in high poverty rural communities. Well, it, depends. it depends what the business is. What type of law work do you do? Agricultural law and estate planning. I have no clue. <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to uh, take a moment to ask a last question. Sure. Um, and we have a lot of entrepreneurs here and a lot of African-American entrepreneurs, many of whom, when they chat, talk to me, always say, all I need is X thousands of dollars or X million. There's always a number, always. right? It's always, if I only had if only, X, yeah, right? If only. And it's this, ca it's a, it's a, my, the biggest impediment in their mind seems to be, quote, access to capital. And I keep saying this, that the biggest impediment for African-American businesses, minority-owned businesses in this country, is not access to capital. It is scale. Because if you don't have scale, I can't sell, even if I make a great widget, right? I make a great bottle of water, bottle of water but I only can make 100 of them. I can't do business with Walmart. I can't do business with Nationwide. I can't do business with AT&T. So the, the biggest obstacle for us is scale. The biggest obstacle for any small business, forget about whether African-American is, is not access to capital, because there's plenty of capital. There, in fact, there's too much capital there's right now, right? There's a, lot of, there's a lot of dumb capital that's chasing yep. business, chasing deals. Mm -hmm. What would your advice be to those who recognize that, yeah, they need money, but it's really about making a better, because scale comes through sales. Right. Scale comes through making a better and that, product. And that's what I tell them. That's right. what I tell them, right? So there's, there's a Shark Tank company from last season called Mush, right? Cool stuff. It's like this um, um, oatmeal that they package. It's fresh dried oatmeal that they package with a little spoon, and you, it has to be refrigerated, but you just grab it and go. And the, the response was great from the show. And now, like I just saw their numbers, they went from 50,000 in sales to 100,000 to 125,000 in three straight months. It's not scale, but they're growing, right? And they all of a sudden are like, okay, we gotta go raise money and we gotta do yada, 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 right? Scale is hard, not just because of the economic cost, but also because of the people cost and the mind share cost. It's hard when you're dealing with a major company, and in particular if you're dealing with a big company like a Walmart or Costco or whatever, because you only get one shot at those guys. And so like I told Mush with Whole Foods, they're interested. I'm like, you're not ready. You're not ready. You have got to, you've got to crawl before you ball, you know, and, 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 and so I told him, it's going to be painful not to go after that big customer, but think about what happens if you go after it and A, it's going to take capital you don't have and you're going to borrow it, or B, it doesn't work out and they return it all. Then all of a sudden you're out of business. And so you're, you're right that you need capital to scale, but you also need the confidence that you can scale and that you can keep your customers happy. And so. I always tell people, get to the point where you have, you've, you've taken care of the customers that you can take care of. Once you can demonstrate that, then you can get smart money and you're talking from a position of power. And then you can go to the Walmarts of the world, the Costcos, and you may not even have to raise money. They may even provide PO leverage or PO support or connect you with a bank that does. And so I guess, I guess what I'm saying is, don't get too far ahead of yourself because sometimes sales can be a lot more expensive than you think they are. And you've got to be careful. I've seen several of my Shark Tank companies try to get too big too fast and it almost put them out of business. And so it, it's not an easy equation to solve, but it's something that, you know, you've, you've got to be careful and confident about that answers your question. Mark, I want to thank you for coming and visiting with us. This is awesome. Thank sharing you. Sharing your wisdom. Um, 
for sharing, sharing your thoughts and for being genuine with our audience and, and coming as an entrepreneur um, and looking at everybody as, as the same and that everyone has value and can bring things. And so, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Mr. Mark Cuban. Thank you, everybody. That was really good. I really appreciate it, but that was fun. Thank that was you, really Mark. Well You've done this before. Once. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Yes, sir.